So I'm going to explain a little bit more in detail what the FanFells initiative is. It was the brainchild of Lonnie, who was just up here. There are 16 fellows who were handpicked for their resource, search, organizational, writing, and personable skills, and have done a splendid job creating this entire event from scratch. We've gone through a lot of processes, all the PowerPoints you've seen, the playlist of music that came before, uh, the flyer, the broadsheet, that was all teenage work. Um, we draw from four schools, ETHS, New Trier High School, North Shore Country Day School, and Fusion Academy. And the students were tasked with a really large and pretty difficult job, and I think they've performed really well. I'd like to stress that we learned a lot from everything we did, and we hope that you all learn a lot, too. Um, yeah, Eno's going to talk to you. <laughs> so the Fan Fellows began to narrow down our topic in around January. Um, and we started with nearly 50 different topics that we were picking from. And after a whole bunch of discussion and a couple rounds of voting, we decided we wanted to do something on the topic of art and activism. And then the Parkland shooting occurred. And as you might imagine, such tragedy had a pretty large impact on all of us as fellows. Um, and so in response to this, we felt that gun violence would be uh, you know, a topic that could make a very stimulating program and would appeal to a large audience. Um, however, we did feel that it was important to bring more light to the everyday gun violence that doesn't nearly get the attention that it deserves. And we kind of wanted to put our own spin on the gun violence that was being you know, dominating in the media right now. Uh, so we felt that it was equally important to bring attention to the violence that doesn't make the headlines every day, yet still has an impact on everybody's lives. We'd like to thank Lonnie and Sharon Grayboys for leading the Fan Fellows Program, for being at every meeting and mentoring us throughout the creation of the program. We'd like to thank the Fan Executive Board and the leaders within Fan who make events like this happen. Um, and we'd like to thank our parents, our family, and our friends for making us available, for driving us places, for caring for us, making us people we are today. Yeah. All right, and then introducing our guests today. First, we have Rihanna Holman and Diamond Ocasio. They are ambassadors of Brave Youth Leaders at the Arc of St. Sabina. Brave is an acronym that stands for Bold Resistance Against Violence Everywhere. Brave was established in 2012 by a group of youth who wanted to make a difference in their community. Members ages 13 through 21 meet weekly to plan various events and activities that promote peace and positive change in the city. They are they are trained in areas of public speaking, advocacy, peer support, leadership, sportsmanship, personal responsibility, and project development. Students have organized several local violence prevention efforts, and they've recently received much national media attention. Brave Youth participated in a documentary on violence by Katie Couric, and a member of Brave was on CNN Tonight with Don Lemon, and also spoke at the March for Our Lives in Washington, in Washington DC, with a speech titled, Everyday Shootings Are Everyday Problems. They'll be in conversation with Phil Andrew, who leads the Archdiocese of Chicago's Violence Prevention Initiatives, where he is responsible for all aspects of safety, programs, and partnership. He is also the principal of PACS Group, a risk preparation, crisis, and conflict resolution agency that establishes organizations to that enables organizations to maintain confidence, build resilience, and safe environments while growing and achieving better outcomes. Mr. Andrew has over 20 years of experience as a special agent at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He served throughout the Midwest, New York, and overseas with expertise in crisis, negoci crisis negotiation, undercover work, counterterrorism, national security, violence prevention, crimes against children, and social media. He's a fairly accomplished guy. He has deployed regularly on domestic and international kidnappings and hostage takings, and he's received numerous FBI and Department of Justice awards. Prior to the FBI, Mr. Andrew practiced law in Chicago and managed a violence prevention organization. He is a graduate of DePaul University College of Law and the University of Illinois, which he attended on, that, on an athletic scholarship and twice captained the Illini swim team. Mr. Andrew is a survivor of the 1988 Winnetka shooting in his family's home that followed the tragic shooting at Hubbard Woods Middle School that killed Nicholas Corwin, age eight, wounded five of his classmates, and traumatized a community. This was the first mass, mass casualty shooting in the United States. Mr. Andrew is a recipient of the U.S. House of Representatives Award for Outstanding Courage and Heroism, an Illinois State Bar Association, Association Service Award, and is an inductee into the Loyola Academy's Athletic Hall of Fame. And finally, <clears throat> it's a beefy intro. <laughs> 
And finally, they'll be in conversation, excuse me, they'll be moderated by Dr. Marcus Campbell. He has served as the assistant superintendent slash principal at ATHS since 2013. In his role, he serves as the educational leader and chief administrator of all school operations and implements and manages policies, regulations, and procedures of the Board of Education, ensuring that all students are educated and supported in a safe, equitable, culturally relevant, and student-centered learning environment. Dr. Campbell earned his doctorate in educational leadership at National College of Education, National Lewis University. He also holds a master's degree in social and cultural foundations in education from DePaul University and a BA from the University of Illinois with a major in English and a minor in African American Studies. Please welcome all of those people. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good, Good evening, evening, Diamond, Rihanna. Good evening, Phil. Um, so this was Trayvon Bosley, who is a founding member of Brave and is now a junior at SIU. And I'm curious, um, Diamond, Rihanna, and then Phil, um, what are your thoughts about uh, what Trayvon just said and actually what he spoke to the country and, and the world uh, about his experience uh, in Chicago with, with gun violence? What are your thoughts about what Trayvon just said? I feel like he summed up like most of the things that happened in Chicago. We're in fear to just, like there's everyday shootings. I mean, there's massive shootings, but there's shootings in Chicago where we don't know if we're gonna make it to school for there to be a school shooting. So we're all fear, we're always fearful and aware of our surroundings as we're going to and fro places. So I feel like he touched that. Um, that's a main topic that would happen in what, what happens in Chicago. And then the, how about how there's just like in Chicago, it's a norm for people to get shot. And it's not, it's not as um, publicized because it happens as uh, daily and like, oh, there's been 10 people shot. Okay, back to you. Um, I feel like he touched on that too. And I agree with all of his speech, like that is what mostly happens in Chicago and that is the daily life in Chicago. Yeah. I feel that one of the main things Trey really spoke on was how Chicago violence is normalized and how the government spends more money on what they need, like divvy bikes and not spending money on school funding or after school, after school funding for to get the the students and the young people off the streets because they feel as if they don't have anywhere to go. And I feel like that's the main topic that he spoke on that was really important in his speech. And Phil, given your background and your expertise, uh, what are your thoughts about Trayvon's comments? I think he speaks the truth. It's, it's, a, it's a, a truth that is hard to hear, that we've ignored this problem and that we haven't empathized with what's happening in these neighborhoods. And I think what's, what's really cool is he was given a voice, that um, the Parkland students connected immediately that there are other people that are suffering from the trauma of gun violence and that fear and uh, the destruction that it has in that your, your personal sense of safety, that they were, they were conscious enough to realize that it's not just them. And they, they found some community in connecting with he and others. Now, Eno and Molly gave a nice introduction of what BRAVE is and what it does, but I'm just curious, um, Diamond Rihanna, from your perspective, can you talk a little bit about, like, in your own words, like, what BRAVE does and how BRAVE is making an impact in, in Chicago? Um, BRAVE is a youth group that gives, the, it, it gives the youth a voice. Usually it will be silent since that, and adults or adults in general will say, like, stay in your place, like, be quiet, you're just a child. But with Brave, it gives you a voice. It gives you like a, some sort of like a, a family to go to and to look forward to, to talk to people, um, how to make change. And um, with Brave, is you feel like you have a voice. And with that voice, it makes you more passionate to want to make a change. Um, and it's like, it's like a home to me. It's like a second home to me. Um, whenever I'm having a bad day and Brave will be like, oh, are you okay? Is, um, are you having a good day? Are your grades up? This is, and it's just like, it's, it's like a homey feeling to Brave where you can speak your mind and you, can, and you won't be shut up for it. You'll, they'll be like, yeah, they'll support you in a way. 
For me, brave is one of the best things I've ever done in my entire life because me being young, I don't really pay attention to politics or what's happening. And then you start watching the news and you see all these young people my age getting shot and killed. And my brother was a part of Brave. He's a Brave alumni. And that's how I got into Brave. And working with Lamar and my fellow Brave youth leaders has Some of them are here tonight. Can y'all wave your hands over here, our Brave folks? Here? Brave. <laughs> Working with my family over there, they've taught me that my voice does matter and that no one can make me be quiet and that I'm a part of this generation that you cannot shut me up because at the end of the day, my voice does matter and I'm just as human as you are. So that's what being a part of Brave has done for me. It's taught me how to be an activist, how to be a leader, and how to support my peers and how to be there for other people. So I couldn't have asked to be a part of a better organization. Wow. Yep. Um, uh, Rihanna, you just said something, I think, that was echoed in Trayvon's speech, and that you feel like you matter, that your life is just as important as someone else's. And I think uh, Trayvon's comments was caring about all communities, uh, and this happened, and most of this violence happens in communities that look like him. Um, so you're, we're racializing the conversation. And my question to you, all three of you, is, and maybe we can start with you, Phil, um, what do we say <laughs> to white people or people who are not of color that this is just a black problem or a Latino problem? What do we say to those folks? Yeah, I, I think we need to say that you need to start thinking and recognizing that these are people. Um, I know these brave youth. Um, I, I've met um, uh, the mother of the brother that was killed. Um, these are just like families like ours. When you lose a child before your own death, what that might feel like. And I think if we just take a moment to think what that must feel like, it connects us and it's gonna motivate us to make, make some changes. Um, the, this is part of our community. This is part of Chicago. The, these, are, these are our neighbors. And if we don't start connecting it's going to spread. And we're, we're seeing that sort of, that heartless lack of empathy as it creeps out. And the solution is us coming together. Yeah. Rihanna, Diamond, either one of you can respond to that question. I feel as if the problem with people of color and white folks are, is that people, White people don't really see what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis because they don't really live in the, the, the non-provinced communities. They don't see our streets and how they're raggedy and how they don't have to worry about being shot and killed on your way to school, on your way home, or just then at the bus stop. But I, I hate to say this, but I feel as if there wasn't all these mass shootings happening, then we would not be connecting with Parkland like we are today. And it's a terrible situation that we have to grow through that. If this wasn't happening, then we would still be so divided. So it's a bad thing that happened, but it's leading to a good ending. Mm -hmm. And to be back off, piggyback off what she said, if um, this mass shooting didn't happen, do you think that we will all come together like this? Do you think um, we will come as one to stop something terrible from happening. Do you think that people's eyes will be as open as they are right now? And to see that something terrible did have to happen for everybody's eyes to open is really sad. And to say that people have been speaking up about gun violence for so long and to know that it's now getting heard is fairly sad to say that we're all divided and we're only worried that some people are just worried about their communities and what happens in their communities and when something bad happens to their communities, they're crying out for help and they don't see that like there's other, there's other things happening in other communities just as bad as theirs. And when they see that, they realize and they want to help. They want to join the fight. And that's what we want. We want everybody to join the fight. Because if everybody's not united, then we're, we're more likely to fall apart. And we don't want to fall apart. We want this to keep going for generation to generation until this problem is solved. 
Because we have to remember that this isn't just activism anymore. It's a social movement mm. where different organizations are coming together for one main common goal. So it's a social movement that's happening now and not just brave doing it by themselves. It's everyone helping out. Right. So I'm glad you said that because, um, uh, you know, our students here at, e at Evanston and some of the fan fellows have been talking a little bit about this and uh, they have a list of questions uh, that they posed uh, for, for you all tonight. And one of the questions here is that, uh, from you all's perspective, and that is, how do mass shootings differ from other kinds of gun violence? Uh, mass shootings in schools, churches, movie theaters, just from your perspective, or even just going to the going to the store on the south side, how do you think that those shootings differ from mass shootings? And any one of you can start. I'll go. Mass shootings are different from everyday school shootings, I mean everyday street shootings, um, because the mass shooter is usually always a white male, and the white male is always giving an excuse to why he did it. Yeah. When it's a everyday shooting, half of the time the people that are shooting up these kids and killing these young people are not even being found and the people that are getting caught are just being labeled as a gangbanger that was doing the wrong thing they don't get an excuse of why they did it so how should a white person that shot up more kids than this one person did get an excuse to why he did what he did it's a problem it's a big problem I say there's a there's a difference, but there at the same time it's not because there's still lives lost. There's still mothers and fathers sobbing for their children dying. There's still um, kids losing their parents. But the difference is there the majority of the time mass shootings are always publicized and like oh my god this just happened. But like everyday shootings aren't as publicized. I feel like everyday shooting people their their faces are unknown to the world. Um, they die and they don't get um, recognized, well not recognized, but like they don't be sh get shown as much as a mass shooting, like somebody can die in 79th and they'll just be like, oh, this person died, not saying their name or like saying like how, where, if they were a good student or not, like they're always, oh, they were probably a gang member and they were getting caught up with gang stuff, but like with the mass shooting, oh, they were sweet kids. They didn't do nothing, nah, nah, nah. And with, like, um, day to day violence in Chicago, it's always like, oh, you, 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 were, you were doing something bad for you to die. But most likely, it would, they weren't doing anything wrong. They were just um, future doctors, lawyers, and everything like that, trying to get by in Chicago and live their life to the fullest because they know they, there's more than likely you will not survive on the streets in Chicago. So that's what I feel like it would be. I find that they're very similar. They're all terrifying. They're all horrifying. They all take life. They all cause lasting trauma for everybody else um, that goes on for a lifetime. They're all preventable. And they are all uh, divide us. The inner city violence, um, somehow we find a way to separate ourselves from that and we don't get the solutions that are right there for the taking. And it's the same with school shootings or shootings that aren't taking place in, a, in an urban violence. Mass shootings are preventable. As, as you saw in the statistics, only 2% of school shootings um, represent the total amount of gun violence in the United States. Of those 2%, nearly over two thirds of them of the perpetrators are known to the community and they get their gun from a home. It couldn't be more easily prevented. And when you overlay that with what's with, with going on in the inner city, it's not different. There's a lot of opportunity to prevent this violence and we don't have to live with it. Now, what where they do depart is what happens after a shooting. So you, you see what happens with a, with, with a mass casualty uh, school shooting, and there are a lot of resources. I was a beneficiary of the resources 30 years ago in the shooting that I was involved in. I was in a caring, uh, resourced community, and I got almost everything I needed from the community to get back on with my life, as best I could, dealing with that kind of trauma. 
Now there's other communities that don't have any of those resources and they live every day with both that fear and the trauma that both the fear and the violence cause and it goes untreated. And then the expectation is, is somehow there to, to, to rise above that. When resourced communities are, are, are throwing everything they can to recover folks, that's what makes, that's why they're so well named. They're as brave as they come because they're, they're making a choice in their neighborhood to take a path and not just take a path to protect themselves, but to change their neighborhood. And you can see that the division piece here is what's most important. It is the violence and the way that we interpret it that divides us. And somehow we're not working together on the same solutions. And, and, and that's the sort of uh, nefarious piece of this, that the, as long as we remain divided, this problem is gonna be difficult for us to solve. As soon as we unite on this, as a community addressing gun violence, we got this one in the bag. Well, Phil, you were um, on the front page of the Tribune today. Um, you talked to Heidi Kleiber Stevens and you, you say this, you say this is a community problem that needs to be addressed at the community level, that solutions lie in listening to the folks who are close to the problem. And in this case, that's teenagers. They're on the front lines and there's momentum for, take, for them taking responsibility for changing our communities. And you were talking about that this is not like a, you don't have like a single scapegoat. It's not just mental health or a culture of violence or things like that. You want to talk about everything. Can you expound upon that just a little bit and really talk about how, you know, Diamond and Rihanna and some others are really sort of galvanizing this effort? Yeah, I, I, I am interested in their solutions because this is the third leading cause of death for teenagers in our country and we're unique in that in our country. So you guys are doing all the dying. Are there anything that you can think of that might help teenagers die from gun violence at a, at a, at a lesser rate, or at least put us in line with other countries? Make stricter gun laws. <laughs> <laughs> Is there more to add, Rihanna? <laughs> yeah. That's a good start. That's a good start. Diamond, what do you think? Um, I feel like less funding on non-essential things, like uh, athletic academies and more on the schools and, and funding the schools and after-school programs so teenagers aren't on the streets um, late at night or something like that. They're in after-school programs getting knowledge, um, bettering them, bettering their education outside of school and like focusing on like other things outside of school so they're not on the streets and stuff like that. I think that would be like a key essential to let increasing the rates of teenagers and young people dying in Chicago. Rihanna, I want to follow up with what you just said. So um, just this past weekend, Friday, uh, there was a shooting in Santa Fe, Texas, and another student about your age says this, I don't think guns are the problem. I think people are the problem. It's a student at Santa Fe High School. Even if we had, uh, did have more gun laws, people who are sick enough to do something like this are still going to figure out a way to do it so it doesn't matter. If you could have a conversation with this student, what would, what would you say? I would tell that student that I agree with them to a certain extent, I guess, because, um, can you repeat what he said? Just said that essentially guns aren't the problem, people are, problem, are the problem, and if you can have all of the gun laws you want, you know, if someone wants to do this, they're going to do this, and what would you say to that student? Um, I say that people are becoming the problem because their trauma is affecting them and but I think that you can't really blame really blame them for that trauma because they don't have any help to deal with the trauma and I think that the the source that you get the help from isn't doing anything the government isn't doing anything to help with the trauma if and, and then the guns are the problem because we wouldn't be dying if it weren't for the, the guns. But at the end of the day, it is the people that's pulling the trigger. So I see what they're coming. See what they're coming from. Diamond, to say something on that, like 
yeah, sometimes people are the problem and like they are the problem um, with gun violence. But like if there was stricter gun laws and it was harder for them to get a gun in the period of time where they want to get that gun, if there was like a witness that and there was more stricter laws, you have to have this, this and that, they would, it would increase because not a lot of people can get all the essential information and all of this. And if there was like, oh, you can't do this, this at this age and this at that there will be an increase because, like, if there wasn't gun laws, don't you think they will just go, like, all willy-nilly and stuff like that? If there were stricter gun laws, people won't have the access to that. Yes, if they were very determined, they could, but it will make it way harder. And then when, the, when they realize it's way harder, they'll just, like, give up because no one wants to fight that hard to get something you know you can't have. Mm -hmm. So if there was that structure of the gun laws... Of course, there'll be a decrease because you can't get it. If you can't get it, you can't do it. If you can't do it, there will be no problem. All right. Bill, did you have anything you want to add to the student in, in Santa Fe? You know, the, the, the statistics, the data is really clear that more guns is more dangerous. Um, when you look at the way the military has organized itself about the training and the regulations in place and police uh, forces and the way they use guns, it's, it's just they have protocols in place, but then general public does not. Um, gun violence takes place primarily in places where guns are available. It takes place less in places where guns are not available. You break it down by states. Um, you break it down by states that are doing background checks. Gun control does work. The, 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 the data is in on it. The, the real question is, why aren't we paying attention to the data? And what's keeping us divided from working on it? And I, and I think at, at the heart of that is really fear. When you start fearing for your life, if it's reached that point in your neighborhood, or you've created some sort of image in your head, that the only way forward for you is violence, then yeah, it's gonna be difficult. But there's so much opportunity for us to get upstream with people and with interventions. These guys are doing a great job of it. There's restorative justice models that are doing empathy-based models where people are just understanding each other before they get a hold of a gun. There's a lot of success there. And we've got, we've got to emphasize those programs. One of the fan fellows, the fan fellows have this question for you, Phil, and that is, what led the Archdiocese de uh, decision to launch the Gun Prevention Initiative? Yeah, I, I think what really led the Archdiocese to this is the uh, that fear piece. That is a community. If we're going to keep living in fear and division, that we're never going to get a get a, get a, get a um, make move forward in this, and recognizing that the 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 needs to treat a community. Um, the Pope, who's, who's probably one of the most popular guys on, uh, on the earth right now, uh, talks about the church being a field hospital. And um, what's interesting is his language is very similar to Brian Stevens. He says, if you want to solve a problem, you got to get close to it. Got to get proxy. And if the Pope and uh, Brian Stevens is telling us both that, uh, that we got to get close to a problem, I say we get into your community and we start learning what the problem is and we start working on a solution. Doing it together is how we get it done. Yeah. That kind of dovetails with one, another question that the fellows had, and that is how can people who are not exposed to gun violence get more educated uh, in the experience of others? And I guess, I, I guess I, what I hear you saying is, is to be more approximate. Right? And then you also talked about empathy. Um, so how do you think um, people who are not proximate to gun violence aren't impacted by gun violence as much? How do we begin to create empathy for the community, for those communities that do? That's my question for all of you. Well, I'm gonna start <laughs> off. Um, I, and I'm gonna start off with an invitation for you guys to talk because that's it. Mm -hmm. It's this, it's forums like this. It's when um, that voice is heard. That having your voice heard when you've been traumatized 
is in it of in of itself part of the solution. That's a way forward. Not only to just start healing a heart, but you start realizing that that's a person. They've got a life. There's a family. There's a mother. There's a whole trajectory that's changed when somebody loses their life. And it's incumbent on us. It's our job to spread the word. We've got to let people know this. And what's beautiful about it is that their voices are now being heard. And it's not going to stop here. We're going to, st- we're going to keep working together until every voice, every, every life in the city that's affected by violence, we know the course of it. And we know what we can do and we can start helping. Um, another thing that we can we can tell our stories and what we've been through in our communities to really get them to empathize empathize with what we have gone through. We can put our shoes on their feet, and we can show them that it could happen to anyone. It, we are not only the targets; you're a target too. Anything can happen to you too. So you have to realize that. Anything is possible in this world that we live in. And that you have to understand that you always have to be on your guard. You always have to understand what everybody else is going through to really get yourself out there and to understand that this isn't just a black and brown life issue. It's an American issue. Yeah, like the people. Like the people in Parkland, they weren't affected before they had the massive shooting. And they didn't really know what was going on with the shootings in all across the country. But to see, like, when they... I hate when I get my words stuck. Um, the people in Parkland, like, they didn't, they, they weren't, they didn't have the experience of gun violence like Wade did. And for them to have the rude awakening, rude awakening that there is a problem with gun violence in Chicago, it's like everyone should be to catch, to look at the news and catch up on things happening in Chicago. And I say it's, it's a, it's a you problem to like, try to learn about your community and it's a us problem to help you learn about your community help um for us to give you our stories and to talk on things like this telling our stories of how we lost members of our family or how our friends or anything happens in chicago due to gun violence so us making you aware and you making yourself aware it'll help and we'll come together and we'll all realize that this is not a just a one place problem or oh there's a few places who have gun violence in Chicago. Gun violence is a is a um a national problem and it's just not it's not just a, a certain place problem. You can somebody in Florida can get um not Florida. Somebody in like a place where there's not likely to be shootings can get shot. It's not like only people like places with massive shootings or like shootings every day that happen. Like there's a lot of weird and odd things that can happen any day. Like, there could be a, I don't know. So I, I think about the personal impact of, um, of gun violence. Um, you know, I was born and raised on the South Side. Uh, I went to several funerals of my friends. Um, Southside is still near and dear to my heart, it's where my mama lives, you know. Um, and that spawned me into action where I wanted to become a teacher. And I wanted to impact the lives of young men, young black men. And uh, it sort of moved me for my, my own personal life's trajectory. So I'm curious for uh, you, Diamond and Rihanna, uh, other than your work with Brave, how do you think that your your conversations about this will impact your life moving forward and like what do you what do you think you what might you do with it um well to to do to like go off what you said you said that you lost like people Mm -hmm. in your life and that changed your perspectives Mm -hmm. i think a lot of us in brave have lost somebody and like we used to want to do so many things in life other than this because Speaking about gun violence as a teenager, you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to do that. Technically, like you shouldn't. Teenagers shouldn't be speaking about gun violence. 
the government and everything should have that down pack like all these years of gun violence and you're not realizing over time that you're losing people of your country um the philosophy is supposed to be we as people and it's not it's like we're not as people we're all separate and we're all like if it doesn't happen to me it's not gonna happen it, it, it's not affecting me i don't care but to like when you lose somebody it takes a toll on you it's it changes your perspective on life like I used to want to be so many things other than what I'm doing today and when I did lose somebody my cousin Frankie it changed my world and it flipped it upside down it spun it around it was like I was in a tornado now I want to advocate for youth in Chicago I want youth's voice to be heard I want people to realize that this is a very big problem and before this the thing that like me losing my cousin, I, I don't think I would have been an advocate that I was today. So that kind of changed my perspective on what I would be doing in the near future. Like, I want to help families in the near, like in the future. I want to help families recover from the loss of a loved one because I know the feeling. I want to help people solve cases that have been closed and in the dark because there was another shooting. 20 more students that other day and they can't solve that problem. I want to be the one to give the family a peace of mind to know that the person who killed them, their child, their father, their brother, their mother is behind bars and they will be punished for what they did and it will not, it will not be enough to compensate for the loss of your child, mother, brother or something like that. But it is like that, oh, there, there's one more person that's evil off the streets or that's bad off the streets and it gives them a peace of mind. So that's what I wanna do. That's how it changed me of like what I wanted to do in my near future. Like it it makes me want to not be the, ch yes, be the change. I am the change now. Like I know I'm the change. I'm gonna be the change and I know that we as this generation are going to be the change because I believe in us and I know that we will get over this obstacle and we will get over this obstacle I do believe and I want you guys to know that you have a voice your voice matters and you need to use your voice to speak up and make sure you're heard that's the main thing make sure you're heard if you're not heard keep talking if you're silence speak louder if you're if you're told oh you're wrong, make sure you're right. Do your research. <laughs> Do your if state your facts and everything like that. Be the person no one wants you to be. Be the one who succeeds in life. Be the one who says, "Ha ha, I did make it. You said I wouldn't make it, but I know I did, and I know I will." Be that person. Brianna. Going forward, how do you think this is uh, your work and your advocacy is going to impact your impact your life moving forward? Um, well, moving forward, I am actually trying to get a Brave Youth Leaders program in my school. I'm working with another teacher that works with organizations to get brave in my school so I can teach my fellow classmates and the young people in my school that they have a voice and they need to speak up at what's happening and that there's always a solution, that violence isn't always the problem because once they see other people being violent and other people talking crazy, then they are gonna be like, oh, well, if that's what I have to do to get my voice out there, then that's what I'm gonna do. But I think they need to know that there's always another way to get your voice heard. And that you get into a fight and you lose, take the loss, okay? It's, you don't have to come back. Revenge is not always the answer. It's always a smarter way to deal, to, to deal with things of this problem. So I think that's one thing that I would do moving forward. Phil, do you have any general thoughts or reactions to how this, your life has been shaped and formed and even what you're going to do um, from this point of moving forward? 30 years ago, when a, when a bullet ripped through my chest, uh, put a hole in both my lungs, my esophagus, my stomach, my pancreas, and it got lodged in my, my, my left swimmer lat, um, I had no idea that this was going to be a problem, that, that, that this was going to continue to happen 30 years later, that we would not have solved this problem. I am so um, 
excited to have partners in this. And I've got a couple teenagers in my house, and I know when a teenager gets something in their head that it's going to get done. You know it. The, um, their voices are powerful. They are not going to forget this. Um, the connection that, they, that, that these youth have made with their counterparts in other parts of the country, in other areas of our city, um, they are building momentum that is going to solve this problem. Well, thanks to all three of you. Let's give them a round of applause.